All right, uh, council member, I apologize for the delay there. Um, we are ready to go when you are. Okay, we probably won't need the timer, uh, will we? Uh, only if one of your colleagues joins, so that's okay. why it's uh, Okay. All right, well, uh, just to let me know when I can begin. Uh, council member, you may begin when you're ready. Good afternoon, I'm Robert White, council member at large and chair of the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities. Today is Thursday, October 28th, 2021, and we are meeting remotely via the Zoom teleconferencing platform. The time is now 1.03 p.m. and I'm calling to order this public hearing of the committee. There's one bill on the agenda for today, B24-174, the Procurement Agency's Alignment Amendment Act of 2021. This legislation was introduced by council members Pinto, Che, and me on March 30th, 2021, and referred to this committee on April 6, 2021 for review. Notice of this hearing was initially filed on June 14th and updated on September 15th. Broadly speaking, the purpose of today's hearing or the purpose of this legislation is to improve how we procure goods, services, and construction on behalf of the District of Columbia by bringing two of our largest procurement agencies closer together. DGS is divided into six divisions, one of which is the Contracts and Procurement Division. Quoting from the division's webpage, quote, the division promotes the operational management of the district's real estate interests with the procurement process intended to deliver goods and services, including construction services, in a timely, economical, and effective manner. This massive responsibility requires DGS to be able to have a quick turnaround for service and construction-related contracts. This is one of the reasons DGS, unlike most agencies, does not currently go through OCP for procurements, but rather is able to operate through its own internal Office of Contracts and Procurement. This legislation initially rose out of oversight concerns about DGS procurement. In response to some of these concerns, some members of the council have advocated for stripping DGS of its independent contracting power altogether. The legislation before us takes a more measured approach by instead adopting three key reforms. First, the legislation would require the chief procurement officer to use his oversight responsibility to annually audit DGS's procurement activities and review training requirements. Given all the risks associated with our procurement procedures, we need all the consistent, knowledgeable oversight we can have. These annual audits and reviews will also provide an opportunity to ensure our procurement agencies have aligned procedures and similar internal goals, controls. The second key reform in this legislation would require all procurement personnel at DGS to receive minimum training at OCP's Procurement Training Institute. The Procurement Training Institute is the district, district government's premier training provider for our procurement staff. If all necessary DGS staff can utilize the institute, it will help ensure minimum training standards, instill a sense of camaraderie for procurement staff across agencies, and allow for economies of scale in our procurement training. The third major reform would require DGS to submit an annual acquisition plan to the council, something OCP already does. Having consistent cross-agency acquisition planning requirements ensures that our businesses, and particularly our small and local businesses, can plan to meet upcoming government needs. In addition, the process of acquisition planning helps our agencies avoid budget or procurement surprises by forcing them to think critically about their needs in advance. Uh, we do not have public witnesses for today's hearing, so I want to uh, welcome and call up Chief Procurement Officer of OCP, Mr. George Shutter, and Director of the Department of General Services, Keith Anderson. Director Shutter, good to see you. Good, good afternoon, Chairman. Good to see you. Director Anderson, good to see you as well. Good to, good to see you as well, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you both know, it is the uh, practice of this committee to put our government witnesses under oath. Uh, um, so I ask you to raise your right hand. And if there's anybody else from your team who you suspect may be testifying, there we are. Mr. Scoff, Mr. Lewis, good to see you both. Um, do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to provide to the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. I do. 
Wonderful. Thank you very much. And um, uh, you can begin your testimonies when you're ready. Do you all know who's testifying first? I will defer to the Chief of Procurement Officer, uh, Director Shutter. Thanks, Director Anderson. Good afternoon, Chairman White and the members of the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities. I'm George Shutter, Chief Procurement Officer of the District of Columbia and the Director of the Office of Contracting and Procurement. I'm pleased to offer testimony on B24-0174, the Procurement Agency's Alignment Amendment Act of 2021, as introduced by Chairman White and Council Members Pinto and Shea. Importance of transparency in the integrity of public procurement. OCP appreciates the council's and particularly the, the committee's dedication in, to ensuring transparency and integrity in all district government contracting and procurement. As the CPO of the district, <clears throat> transparency and integrity in contracting and procurement are central to my role. And I take my role of safeguarding the public trust in our government very seriously principles that I know that Mayor Bowser and Director Anderson hold in high regard as well. Additionally, I feel a deep responsibility for ensuring that the entirety of procurement activities in the district, including those activities that occur within district agencies independent of the authority of the CPO, are carried out in a manner consistent with law, fair, equitable, and transparent. It's my duty to serve all agencies by providing the support, training, and advice that they may need. As part of the support, OCP team, OCP's team of professionals, including those in internal auditing roles, uh, audit and review contracting and procurement actions that the CPO deems necessary. These actions are performed as the needs arise to ensure compliance with district requirements for client and independent agencies. OCP's existing authority and programs. As written, the Procurement Agency's Alignment Amendment Act of 2021 would require OCP to conduct an annual audit of the procurement activities of the Department of General Services and submit an audit report with recommendations for improvement to the council. The legislation would further require OCP's Procurement Training Institute to provide training in DGS's procurement personnel and compile an annual review of DGS's training requirements and needs. As you know, the Procurement Practice Reform Act, the PPRA, is the primary law governing the procurement practices in the district. The law grants the CPO certain oversight authority with some limitations to help re regulate district government procurement. The PPRA recognizes three primary categories of procurement authority in the district. Agencies that govern by the PPRA and are under the authority of the CPO, and those are 79 agencies, Agencies governed by the PPRA, but are independent of that authority of the CPO. There are 15 agencies, including DGS. And then agencies that are not governed by the PPRA and are independent of the authority of the CPO. The law authorizes the CPO to exercise that option to review and monitor procurement by any district agency, including those exempt under the law or authorized to procure independently of the CPO. Accordingly, the CPO has periodically exercised this authority to audit and review the procurement activities of agencies independent of the CPO as deemed necessary by the executive. As such, OCP has a robust process in place to conduct reviews, audits, and analysis of district procurement programs and core contracts. We have the privilege of working closely with DGS on previous audits of certain DGS procurements. While the Audits, while the audits have occurred independently based on risk assessment and resources available, these periodic reviews have been beneficial in detecting any areas of concern in DGS procurement systems or structures. While OCP supports the intent of this legislation in seeking transparency in the procurement process by implementing supplementary safeguards as well as staff training, I note for the committee that OCP already has the authority to audit DGS under the PPRA and has audited the DGS contracting and procurement transactions in the past. In regards to the proposed mandatory training requirements including within this, included within this legislation, I would like to highlight OCP's ongoing training resources offered through the Procurement Training Institute that are available not only to DGS, but all independent district agencies to help facilitate the training and development of procurement staff. In addition to training, 
PTI offers a library of resource material for use by any interested party. As always, OCP intends to continue our coordination efforts with independent agencies and services provided through the PTI to ensure the, the development of staff and the standardization of procurement practices across the district. Resource concerns to implement. I would additionally like to note for the committee that while OCP is not opposed to the Procurement Agency's Alignment Amendment Act of 2021, we are concerned that the legislation lacks certain provisions that would be necessary to sufficiently carry out the requirements of the bill if implemented. The requirement of, in the legislation for OCP to conduct an annual audit of DGS procurement activities and submit a report with recommendations for improvement would necessitate an increase in OCP staff time and resources. Were resources already limited given the 7.5 billion in contracting actions OCP is expected to execute this year? Unfortunately, the legislation does not include additional resources that would provide support for executing the requirements of the bill, nor does it offset the diversion of, of funding within the OCP budget from other regular services that OCP already provides to its client agencies and to the public. We ask the council and the committee to strongly consider the significant impact that a diversion uh, in resources would have on OCP's execution of, of current services for client agencies in our work with the vendor community. Additionally, the legislation is unclear in the timetables for implementation of certain requirements in the proposed law. For instance, the legislation would require annual audits of DGS procurement activities. However, it does not provide a specific timeline or date for when the audit shall take place. My desire is for the resources necessary to implement this bill to be made available to the agency before the required implementation date. In conclusion, I again convey my appreciation to the committee regarding your commitment to transparency and integrity in the drafting and introduction of this legislation that would enhance oversight of the district's procurements. With this in mind, we urge council to consider the increased cost of legislation would have on the already limited staff and resources within OCP. We look forward to continuing our work with DGS and the council to improve district's procurement process. I want to thank Mayor Bowser, City Administrator Donahue, and Assistant City Administrator Parker for their continued leadership and support. And I thank you, Chairman White, and the members of the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities for the opportunity to testify and your ongoing support of OCP. This concludes my prepared testimony, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, Chairman. Uh, thank, thank you, Chief Shutter. Director Anderson. Yes. Good afternoon, Chairman White, council members, and staff of the Committee of Facilities and Procurement. I am Keith Anderson, Director of the Department of General Services. I'm here today to present testimony regarding B24-0174, the Procurement Agency's Alignment Act of 2021. I'm joined by George Lewis, Chief Procurement Officer for DGS, and Matt Scalf, DGS Legislative Director. I also want to I also want to acknowledge the district's chief procurement officer, George Shutter, who has been a strong partner with DGS during his time leading the Office of Contracting and Procurement. The mission of the Department of General Services is to build, maintain, and sustain the District of Columbia's real estate portfolio. The department's own real estate portfolio includes 173 million lot square feet with 688 buildings totaling more than 37 million, 37 million building square feet. This portfolio is currently assessed at over $19.8 billion in value. One of the agency's primary charges is, to, is in the care of this portfolio, is contracting for and delivering new projects and making physical improvements to existing spaces for district residents and staff. To this end, DGS is currently managing contracts for 327 total active construction projects with a total portfolio budget of $2.69 billion. The breakdown of active construction projects by real estate asset includes the following. Schools, 81 pro active projects. Department of Parks and Recreation, 83 active projects. Government facilities, 49 active projects. Health and Human Services, 40 active projects. And Public Safety, 74 active projects. This level of activity makes the Department of General Services the largest developer in the District of Columbia. This is a significant amount of activity for one agency 
And I am very proud of the whole DGS team for all of our efforts related to construction contracts, as well as the goods and service services contracts, which ensure maintenance and security of the district's assets. This level, level of construction and service output at DGS results in a very large volume of time sensitive contracting work. The agency's contracting authority has allowed us to deliver on purchase orders in support of delivering construction projects, ensuring continuation of vital maintenance and security services and fulfilling our mission. Part of this success is attributed to the streamlined contracting functions under the agency's independent procurement authority. The agency's ability to internally coordinate with each division involved at various levels in the scope of projects and our ability to be agile and adapt to shifting project priorities have helped to ensure the delivery of high quality and on-time facilities and facility-related services to district residents. Though the level of project complexity, tight timelines, and client-serving aspects of our, our contracts distinguish DGS from other agencies under OCP's procurement authority, we have recognized the importance of collaborating with OCP to closely align our efforts. Specifically, we have focused on mirroring OCP's efforts to support the CBE community, providing staff with a strong training program and ensure transparency and compliance with all laws and regulations. I am pleased to share with you examples of the steps we have taken to ensure alignment of DGS with OCP on our approach to contract. DGS, like OCP, has a strong focus to ensure that the CBE community uh, and, and SB communities are able to access opportunities. I am proud to report that DGS has continued its track record of exceeding annual CBE spend goals as presented in Mayor Bowser's annual Green Book and FY20, the most recent fiscal year for which final numbers are available, DGS spent $301.7 million on small business enterprises, exceeding its spending goal of $244.8 million by 23%. To ensure we continue meeting our spend goal and our projects continue, routinely, uh, continue to routinely develop CBE and workforce capacity, our contracting and procurement division maintained CBE outreach throughout uh, the fiscal year. At DGS, and DGS continues to take additional steps to exceed our CBE spend goals. For example, in FY22, Mayor Bowser increased the DGS facilities maintenance local non-personnel services budget by 6.9 million across multiple asset classes. DGS plans to spend uh, these maintenance funds with contractors through a competitive solicitation using our local DC-based certification, business certified business enterprise indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contract holders. This new investment in CBEs is, is in addition to other DGS plan contracts, which are awarded in line with the district's CBEs laws and regulations. Regarding training for staff, DGS has aligned practices with OCP by utilizing the OCP Performance Training Institute. PTI offers training to contract specialists on subjects such as foundations, a focus on the basis of the district procurement process, a procurement lifestyle, contract management, tier two advanced training focused on topical contracting matters, past buyer training, PCAR training, and e-invoicing. We are proud of the work we have done to align our training with OCP. We believe our joint training approach is the best use of the district's training resources and provides our vendors with a consistent experience across the entire district government. This cross collaboration between both agencies has been vital to, to supporting our staff in the critical work to meet the agency's mission. DGS also complies with the same transparency requirements, laws and regulations as OCP, including the Procurement Practices Reform Act, the Quick Payment Act and 27 DCMR. In addition, to contracting requirements under the DGS Establishment Act. Primarily, these laws do the following. Ensure transparency in procurement process, promote full and open competition, foster effective and equitable broad-based competition in the district, 
support increased public finance confidence in procurement, ensure fair and equitable treatment of all persons, and promote uniform procurement procedures district wide. Further, to ensure accountability and transparency of how the district spends its tax dollars, Section 201 of the Procurement Practices Reform Act gives the district CPO the authority to review and monitor procurements by, an agent, by any agency, including those exempt under the act or authorized, authorized to procure independently of OCP and as such as DGS matter. All of these laws are vital to, ensure, in, to ensuring DGS and OCP follow the same rules and regulations and best practices for procurement while simultaneously providing DGS with a seamless process to minimize risk and put the agency in the best position to deliver high quality and on-time facilities and services for district residents. DGS appreciates the committee's shared goal, uh, shares the goal of continued alignment of DGS and OCP practices and procedures. Indeed, many of the provisions of B24-0174 reflect the efforts that both agencies are already making to ensure that we are in lockstep. However, we would like to highlight for the committee that section 2A2, which requires the CPO complete an annual audit of DGS procurement activities, represents a change uh, to the agency operations that will incur a fiscal impact. While the CPO already has the authority to conduct an audit on DGS under current law, this authority has previously been exercised only when there is a specific reason or concern that would indicate an audit may be needed. In practice, audits have not been an annual exercise. Compliance with audits generally requires a significant amount of DGS agency staff time and resources. Because such audits have been relatively rare in the past, DGS has been able to keep up with our workload uh, required using current staff resources. However, if audits uh, procurement, if audit procurement activity were to be required annual, annually, as contemplated by the provision, then DGS would need additional staff resources to ensure compliance with the, with the audit audits while still being able to continue contracting activities in a timely manner. We hope to work with the committee on fully accounting for this fiscal impact, such should this legislation move forward to markup. In conclusion, DGS stands ready to work with the committee and with OCP to continue our shared mission to obtain the goods and services upon which district residents rely on every day. This concludes my testimony. I'm happy to answer any questions that you or the committee may have. Uh, thank you both very much. Um, I'm going to try to move expeditiously because uh, we have had several conversations about this over the years. Um, so Chief Shutter, you in your testimony, you said OCP would need additional supports to, to implement this. What, what, what additional supports? And, and by that, I mean, aside from funding, because uh, you know, one, one of the notes you made about the legislation is that it doesn't provide financial resources, but legislation doesn't. We do that through the, through the budget. So outside of funding, what, what additional supports uh, would, would OCP need? So, Chairman, what I'm uh, speaking about is, is is resources, and I am speaking broadly about the audit function for resources. As Director Anderson um, uh, articulated very well in his testimony, that both the auditor and the auditee uh, are engaged in, in in an audit function. So, it is completely a matter of resources, and the individuals that are performing the contracting function on a day to day basis are, in fact the individuals that are audited and are needed to be engaged on both sides uh, of, the, of the audit. So it, it is solely a matter of, of, uh, of resource and, and adjustment of resources. Okay. Uh, right now, o OCP submits an annual acquisition plan to the council and uh, it uh, provides an overview of the plan procurement for 61 agencies uh, under the authority of OCP. What, what benefits does OCP see coming from um, this annual uh, acquisition planning process? The acquisition planning, uh, Chairman, is core to a uh, efficiency of 
functioning, an efficiently functioning uh, operation. You, you, the, the benefit of, of planning is understanding prior to getting into the, the next year, what are the contracting and procurement requirements uh, that the jurisdiction has and, and doing it in a deliberate way and doing it in a meaningful way and doing it in a way that is, that is specific. And what I mean by that, Chairman, is working with, we work with each of our 79 client agencies and uh, we'll work through with their program managers to understand uh, the requirements that, that are new that will need to be acquired in the next fiscal year and the, the, the budget that is approved or any requirements that are uh, contract actions such as exercising an option period in an, in an ongoing contract. Having that information is critical to all of the stakeholders. It's critical to industry so that we're able to take that acquisition plan and, and glean from that acquisition plan, the, especially the new requirements uh, so that we can give a forecast to industry on the requirements that, that the district will be acquiring. So there's the forecasting uh, ability that comes out of an acquisition plan. There is the, uh, there is the planning ability uh, for, the, inter for the, the contracting as well as program manager resources uh, that both the contracting agency as well as the client agency has. In our acquisition plan, uh, we work through and we, we send as part of the acquisition plan the, the number of staff that are supporting uh, those agencies on the program as well as on the contracting side. So we use those plans to shift resources against that, against the plan. Um, so that's uh, a, another important uh, function of it. And the other piece of it that's critical is management and understanding of uh, the acquisitions coming in the, in, the, uh, in the coming months and year with the client to ensure that if we're looking for a system to be implemented, being able to back plan uh, the time that is involved in, in acquiring that system and the resources that are necessary, both with the program management tech staff, as well as the legal staff, as well as the contracting staff, in order to form the integrated procurement teams that are necessary to ultimately acquire the goods and services that we need for, for our residents. So um, Director Anderson, does DGS do a similar uh, annual um, procurement uh, plan? We do, however, we do not submit to council. We actually posted on our website and communicated with our CBEs and venues such as uh, the CBE symposium, which is actually coming up on uh, November 3rd, uh, which is where it gives us an opportunity uh, to, to, to speak with the local businesses so CBEs in our community uh, to let them know what, our, what, what procurement plans we have coming uh, over the next fiscal year so that uh, to meet our clients' needs uh, and so that they can properly prepare for some of those opportunities as well. So you do, you do it annually? You do an acquisition plan annually? Yes, which is posted on our website. Okay. Um, how detailed is, is your acquisition plan compared to, to OCPs? Chair sure, Miller, this is George. Let's um, you're it's similar. You're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry. This is not my first time. <laughs> good, good afternoon, Chairman. Yeah, it's one of those days. No, clearly, um, as one of the, um, the past um, employees from OCP that actually manage acquisition plans, we take acquisition planning here at DGS very seriously. And Director Shud is, is smiling because I was, <laughs> I was one of the first managers that actually um, put forward his vision for acquisition planning. So we take that very seriously. So if you go back to our website, Chairman White, and this is probably before you came to the council um, in 2016, we've started acquisition planning um, to Director um, Anderson's point. We may not have filed it in the last couple of years, but the intent is to make sure that we have sufficient information so vendors can see exactly where we're going. So we do have an acquisition plan that gives you the entire by quarter. We also have a monthly forecast as to what we expect for the next month. So that's on our website, Carly. I mean, does it, I mean, 
for 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 the perspectives of the user, not not the government, but the users of the acquisition plan, wouldn't it make would it make sense for us to just have one citywide acquisition plan? If DGS does one and OCP does one, would, would it make sense for us to do just one? I think it makes sense. I think uh, Director Shutters have made a great um, strides in making sure there's transparency across the district where there's a unified approach to acquisition planning. But I think there's also a need to independently, um, and the business community look to DGS and other independent agencies for procurements on our website as well. So we customize it in that way. But uh, we think we've made efforts to coordinate with OCP to have a larger, to your point, a larger procurement plan for the entire district. So as a business person, I can then go to OCP transparency site and see exactly what's going on at uh, DDOT, what's going on at OCP, what's going on at CFSA. So, so pretty much OCP has those data on their website. Um, maybe we need to do better coordination and spreading the news about what we do, but uh, we've been coordinating on those efforts for the last couple of years. And if I could just add, uh, Chairman, that uh, our uh, DSLBD uh, and the other thing I wanted to mention is, is Director Anderson did as well. It was great, uh, great insight in the planning for our, for our CBE community, because then the, there is the understanding of what are the new requirements uh, that that we're able to go after and have that forecast and that foresight uh, that allows for allows for planning. Uh, and DSLBD every year produces our, our green book and the information from the acquisition plans throughout the district are in fact coordinated uh, and are the uh, is the, the data that is supported from the green book. So that does in fact take place now, Chairman. Okay. And what um have you observed uh, benefits to small businesses having the acquisition plans being made available uh, to, to the public? Like how does, um, how, how does this help local businesses, particularly small businesses? I, I, would, I would start, Chairman, just by saying the, the proof is in the, is in the, fa is in the facts. And uh, if we go back uh, a number of, of uh, five or six years ago where the district uh, was executing about just over $300 million of prime contracts with CBEs. Last year, that number was, uh, was $1.4 billion. So it has increased every year uh, in the last seven years that, that I've been a part of uh, the district's plan acquisition planning efforts. And it has been a concerted effort. And I would say, if we look at those plans uh, in the green book, uh, and the, the execution of that book uh, over the, the years, uh, the increase in execution with our CBEs shows both the focus of the district and the strength of our CBE community as well. Well, um, and I know DGS mentioned uh, exceeding uh, CBE and SBE spend goals as, as well, but are, are we what are our metrics in terms of the number of CBEs as opposed to just the, and, and SBEs, as opposed to just the amount that we spend with them? So are we, is that increasing every year? And, and how are we, like, what's our, what's our goal in terms of the number of SBEs and CBEs we contract with? We, the goal we, is to- Go ahead, George. Uh, Chairman White, I think the goal has always been um, on bundling. So we have better um, opportunities with smaller companies. We also want to bring in new companies in the district. So that's been our focus. How do we bring new companies into the district rather than just the same 20 companies that we've done business with before? So we, we make a concerted effort to bring in new business, look at new capability statement, have extended outreach um, to across the district uh, to make sure that co companies that want to do business with us know that we're open for business. And that's why I think such a the CBM symposium was so important because it allowed it, allowed, it gives an opportunity for a new CBE who's just set up or has been around and not familiar with the DGS. It allows them to see what procurements are coming down the pike and what month and what opportunities they may want to take advantage of. And if there's an opportunity that may be uh, a bit larger, then it also gives them an opportunity to meet and network with other CBEs and perhaps venture on opportunities uh, that may come up uh, in our within our CIP. Does DGS or OCP track or, or report the number of CBEs and SBEs that you contract with annually? Chairman, we do know uh, we do know that the number the the metric that uh, 
that we track and um, and send out is is dollar, uh, but we we do certainly know and uh, understand that the number of CVEs as well. And Director Shutter, the same thing for DGS. And the metric that we track is the dollar spent, but we do know exactly who we did business with over the course of the year and can look at that trend move over historic using historical data. Uh, so uh, obviously. Um, DGS is not required to uh, present an annual acquisition plan to um, the council, but but it's indicated that they do uh, already um, in a, in an annual acquisition plan. What, what I wasn't clear on is is what the what the differences are between the acquisition plan DGS does and the the one OCP does. So are, are there any main differences and and how those are and what the type of information that's available thank you for the question i think what we look at is we we want to make sure it is quickly someone looking at a website could see the type of procurement estimated value uh, those are the things we normally put on our website um, internally we may go more detailed as far as what is the process but as far as to make the requirements available to a vendor we pretty much it's similar to what OCP does in the sense that we pretty much we lay out the type of procurement action it is, the estimated value, and then the time frame that we expect to have that procurement available. Okay. And how 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 uh, how often do you does DGS find itself amending this uh, acquisition plan? We um, we try to start with in September first when the, well October first actually because that's the new budget year or even before that if we can anticipate uh, for capital expenditure for example we'll know what's in the CIP for five years so we try to put those out if we know exactly if we have schools for example we knew in July how many schools we we're going to put out for this year so those would be on our website to show businesses hey these are schools that are coming out on our website um, in regards to um, the other procurement actions we normally try to get our budget by October 1st we post it on our website and show exactly what the acquisition plan is so we lay out the requirements we lay out exactly when the timing for those procurements are so to the director's um, Anderson point we can then have business anticipate when they're going to be able to to at least um, move, mobilize and get ready to participate in those programs. So for us, a lot of the smaller CB companies are concerned about bonding capacity. So we want to make sure they understand exactly where those procurements are coming out and exactly what the bonding amount would be. So that from the feedback we received from vendors, that has been very helpful for them. Um, <clears throat> And I think uh, both uh, Chief Shutter and Director Anderson mentioned in, in your testimony that OCP already has statutory authority to, to do audits of uh, DGS procurements. Is, is that right? That is correct. That's correct, Chairman. Uh, is, is that a, uh, an authority that, that you have exercised in, in recent years? And if, if not, why not? I, I do exercise that authority, uh, Chairman. Okay. Uh, when, roughly, when was the last time in the, in the recent recent history? Yes, Chairman. The last the last uh, audit that we did of G, of uh, DGS was in June of nineteen. Um, the purchase card program was the last uh, stated audit. You know, we have uh, as the CPO that authority to to audit can be anything from a review or a discussion with a, a director or a contracting officer. Uh, through an actual audit. And uh, so that to answer the question, June of 19 was the last uh, formal audit that was done on Department of General Services. And how do you, uh, particularly for independent aid or agencies with independent procurement authority, how, how do you uh, determine when you will do an audit and, and what the audit will be? So chairman, with the resources that we have uh, that are able to perform uh, audit and, and perform that function, uh, we have an annual uh, auditing plan that we work through and that's based off of the acquisition plan where, they, where are the plan procurements, where do we see risk? Uh, we have an audit committee uh, that meets periodically that, uh, approves that approves that audit plan. The audits take place uh, they're, they're analyzed, they're, they're brought together, they come back to the audit committee, uh, and we review uh, particularly any trending items to 
to adjust uh, policy to ensure that we're focused correctly on training and to, to learn generally from those audits. Uh, and so are, are the audits ever comprehensive with uh, agencies with independent procurement authority or are they always uh, focus on a, a particular area? Uh, sometimes they're focused on a, on a function. Sometimes they're focused on individual contracting officers and the actions that they had taken. Sometimes they're, they're focused on a program such as a purchase card program within an agency. They may be focused on individual, uh, an individual cardholder, uh, for exa example. So it's, it's really a matter, Chairman, of uh, what are we looking at from a risk perspective based on resources? Uh, what are the, the audits that the agency and the district are currently working? We have a CAFR every year. We have our, our, this year we're involved with the triannual audit. We have a uh, COVID audit that's happening. Uh, there's the general oversight of, of procurement uh, reviews with the inspector general. So those, those audits external against risk internal is how I use the resources that are available to us based on those risks uh, to, uh, to do those reviews. Uh, the, um, I, I, I can't remember, I think it was Director Anderson's testimony mentioned that um, EPS does um, take advantage of OCP's Procurement Training Institute, is, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. We do send our contract specialists to OCP's training um, to try to streamline and make sure that uh, our vendors have the same experience. So um, there's a plethora of tra training at the PTI that we uh, that we um, take, um, which uh, which includes foundations, procurement lifecycle, contract management, tier two advanced training, focus on topical tra contracting, pass buyer, uh, P card training, and e invoicing. So uh, we do send our specialists to the training uh, that OCP uh, provides. Uh, to ensure that we're we're in lockstep with OCP, and okay. we definitely appreciate the the coordination with with Director Anderson, and it is it is deliberate uh, because we will look at requirements, and if there is an influx of of staff that's coming in, uh, we we can adjust and and uh, have the training courses on demand as 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 we need them. So DGS has been a fantastic uh, partner, uh, George Lewis. Uh, was one of the first uh, to go through the uh, the initial three tiered certification program that we developed in the, in the district, and we're actually on uh, almost a, a third round, is how I think of it, of of training our contracting officers uh, going into the future. So, so some of these trainings are, are now on demand. Or are you saying they will be in in the future? Uh, some of them are on demand now, Chairman. Uh, and in the future, what I'm looking at is uh, really being focused about what is the content that we need to own in the district, it, because it, it, there's a cost of ownership of content. What is the what is the training that is truly on demand that you can you can pull in for contracting 101 right now? So uh, really having a deliberate thought about uh, the best way to bring training uh, in a very um, uh, in the most efficient way. We, the, the faster that we're able to, to bring in an individual and get them understood through the, the district requirements, uh, have them certified in the, the areas that, that they need to, uh, being able to have the access to the systems that they have, uh, that matters. And, and uh, we're focused on it and DGS and OCP coordinate that very well. Um. Is there a, an MOU uh, between agencies with the independent procurement authority to utilize the uh, Procurement Training Institute, or how does how does that work? And is there a cost to the agencies? We have not had the need for an MOU, Chairman. Uh, what I have done uh, as a as a general matter of, of policy over the, the years is that it's it's always space available for our agencies uh, outside of, of OCP, but I'm, I'm not aware of a situation where uh, we were not able to uh, provide the training or work with the agency, especially if, if an agency is focused on a particular area and you know, they, they wanna have a, a class around that. Uh, 
that that ad hoc training that is I think very important and uh, and very practical. And so uh, George Lewis is is the you know running running contracts at, at DGS. If there are contemporary uh, contemporaneous issues that that he's working with, he knows and is able to reach out to the the director of, of PTI and uh, either talk through what are what are the current courses that we might have to offer, uh, or what are things that that we need to to adjust in? Or, or do um, do all uh, executive branch agencies have uh, the same level of access to the procurement training institute? Yes, Chairman. So, Chairman, if I may add, also there's also um, we rely on OCP for the training of our COTARs. Those are our actual. Uh, contract officer representative in the field. We also um, use them for contracting officers training as well. So we've been very um, grateful to Director Shutter as well as Deputy Director Nancy Hayman to um, help us through those processes. But we do believe training is important to us. We take it very seriously. Um, one of the, the training that we've done in the past is NIGP training for our staff. We've actually had on-site training for our staff across the board. So we normally have a training budget that we work through to make sure that our staff is aware of the national trends as well as best practices across across the world. So those are training for us is very serious. I, I'd even add to that if I if I may, Chairman. Uh, I, I would add that uh, DGS and, and George Lewis, um, you know, this has been a couple of years past. What what George was referring to on contract administrator training, uh, that was a big push in, in DGS, a very good one. And uh, we work together to revamp uh, entirely the contract administrator course. And, and frankly, Chairman, it went from a two to three hour course to a two day comprehensive course that contract administrators bring their contracts in. They, they work through scopes of work. They, they work through how do you do receiving and how do you do it in the system? So uh, in fact, DGS is, is an independent agency uh, pushing on our system for improved training has now improved the training that we provide writ large uh, to the district. So the the the, the requirement in uh, Bill twenty four dash one seventy four uh, for OCP to provide training to all DGS procurement personnel through the Procurement Training Institute wouldn't really change anything uh, compared to what what's what's currently happening. It would not change the practice, in my opinion, Chairman. Okay. Now, it, the is is there procurement training uh, at OCP or uh, agencies under OCP's OCP's authority um, procurement training outside of the procurement training institute, or is that all where all the procurement training happens? <clears throat> The Procurement Training Institute chairman is the coordinator of training. And we do have uh, various programs that do incorporate uh, other facilities or other areas of training. Uh, George Lewis mentioned a national organization that, that provides training. So uh, we will coordinate that uh, as well. Um, the annual procurement symposium that we do, we'll bring in uh, people from the outside and, and invite our uh, independent uh, agency colleagues for for that as well, uh, but think of the procurement training institute as the area that is that is able to provide both the library and the content for training for uh, for acquisition professionals throughout the district. We provide training for requisitioners, uh, all requisitioners in the, in the government. We provide training for uh, purchase card holders, including those purchase card holders in the council. Uh, so the training is uh, is substantial, Chairman. Okay. I, I guess I'm trying to get a sense of what, if any, differences there are between the training for procurement professionals in, in OCP uh, and uh, in agencies under OCP's authority and DGS. Are, are there any differences in, in training or resources? Chairman, whether an independent, I'll start, uh, but whether an independent agency does additional training outside of what the, the PTI offers, that would certainly be uh, uh, likely. 
Um, but that training that that is offered is is our standard is our our training and it's it's approved in the district, uh, and that is provided to any agency that would would like it. Uh, we do um, uh, discuss this and, and reconfirm this in our district best practices group uh, that meets uh, a, a number of times a year where all of the, the independent agencies are invited with, with OCP to talk about uh, what has changed in procurement, what are the current ongoing issues, and to advise on, on what uh, might be available or might, might be different in, in, in training as well. And um, sorry, mm -hmm. if I, may. Um, I think one of the areas that we're looking at currently is supply chain management. Um, mm -hmm. As you know, that has impacted the entire region and the world, really. So we look into that to make sure that we're prepared for those issues because it has impacted our procurement process. And, you know, Director Shutter can attest to that. This is really, we're looking at backlog of equipment as well as materials. So we want to make sure that we're in front of those sort of issues. So our focus for this year is how do we make sure we can manage our supply chains better? Mm -hmm. And that actually leads me to, to to my next question, which is that, I mean, I assume that uh, DGS staff will need some type of specialized training for procurements that's unique to DGS. So how is that, how, how is that handled now? Uh, currently, we look to NIGP um, and other um, national agencies to get uh, training in, in particular related to construction, because as you know, we're, we're, our construction is very unique. We do design builds, design it build those sort of things. So we're pretty much very much concerned about best practices. What are the trends? How do you get our staff to be up to date on those issues? So that's been our focus. Um, and I think that the distinction would make that clearly for us, that's an area that we want to focus on. Okay. And you, you use an acronym that I'm not familiar with. And uh, it's the National Institute of uh, Public Procurement. Okay. Thank you. It's a national um, agency that pretty much support public agencies across the district and the world. Okay. And uh, Director Schotter, what one of the uh, things uh, this legislation would do is to require OCP to get feedback on training needs from other agencies or agency directors. How do you currently evaluate the training that you provide uh, at the Training Institute? Um, I would get that feedback from uh, that procurement practices, best practices uh, group is where I would, where I would seek that. Um, okay. What, what about, uh, uh, agencies with independent procurement authority? Uh, that's what I'm mentioning, Chairman. That's where I would get the feedback from those agencies or areas that they okay. want us to, to focus in on. Now, as far as the quality of classes and the quality mm -hmm. of training, uh, that is done through, um, uh, reviews of classes, uh, at the, at the end of a, at the end of a class. Okay. Um, so do you, do you currently, um, solicit feedback from, from agencies with independent procurement authority? We solicit information from agencies with independent procurement authority at the best practices group. Okay. Uh, and anybody that would take a course, uh, we would, have, we would solicit information from them from at the end of the course. Um, and as well, we do uh, annual surveys of our, of our client agencies, uh, and there is an, an area that uh, any feedback is, is welcome as well. We've done that for the last two years, Chairman. Okay, I appreciate it. You, your answer said you would do it, and, I, and so I wasn't clear if, if it's something that you might do in the future. We do, we now, do it, sir. We now, do now it, sir. I understand. Yeah. Okay. On my mind is, the, is next quarter's uh, meeting that's, that's set up. So okay. yes, we do it, and we will do it. Okay. And D DGS follows the PPRA um, entirely? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Quick claim that 27 DCMR follows. Okay. So what, what I take from the testimonies so far is that there is no difference between DGS's procurement practices or trainings uh, 
from OCPs, although there may be some things, uh, some procurement aspects specific to DGS that you may go, you know, elsewhere for, uh, or, you know, go, or go above and beyond what, what may be offered by, through OCP. Is that accurate? Yes, correct. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, so this, this bill would uh, require, um, well, actually, I, I already went through that. Um, <clears throat> So the the, um, the bill would, would require OCP to exercise its existing authority by performing an annual audit on the procurement activities of, of DGS, as, as, as you both noted in, in your testimonies. Um, do you think, Director Anderson, that DGS would be able to demonstrate its compliance with the, the PPRA? Uh, demonstrate our compliance? Right. Yes, we so would it, be able to demonstrate our compliance. Okay. And um, the one thing you noted in your testimony is was a funding concern for the uh, OCP annual audit that is proposed in the bill. Um, to my understanding, uh, agencies uh, are audited routinely, but don't get funding to respond to an audit. Um, are, are you currently funded to respond to, to any audits? Uh, I do not believe so. Okay. So are we funded? Um, we, we currently use our, our to the director's point earlier, we use our contract staff to support the audit um, responses. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when you, and, and I, I, I know this may sound redundant, I, I just wanna make sure we're not missing anything. When DGS hires um, procurement staff, the, what, what kind of training do they have outside of OCP procurement training? We have an annual um, an internal training where we train them on our manual and procedure. We have a SOP that is uh, updated uh, annually. Uh, we train them on that. We train them on the PPRA. We train them on 27 DCMR as well as uh, our establishment um, authority on the 47 uh, DCMR. Um, so pretty much we go through the entire process and make sure we onboard them properly. We also um, make sure that once they're on board, then we try to get them into the PTI program to make sure that if their weaknesses we've identified, those can be um, targeted. Um, but we also want to make sure that they do have the fundamentals of district procurement. And district procurement is extremely unique in comparison to many um, jurisdictions across the nation. So, in that sense, we our goal is always to make sure we have staff ready to perform um, quickly, uh, but also um, do it the right way. Now, does this uh, does this training or these trainings happen over time, or is this sort of an onboarding? process? Uh, it depends on the luxury we have as far as time. We, we try to get it done quickly, but we oftentimes we're trying to, with the pandemic and the response we've had to make in the past, we've been, training has been lacking, but we're making sure we're going to jump back on that quickly. But um, the priority has always been once a new staff come aboard, he or she is aligned with the agency, they will have them work with another senior uh, procurement staff to make sure they understand the process. They have questions. We have quarterly meetings. Um, and then each manager has a monthly or daily or weekly meetings with their staff to make sure they fully understand um, processes, as well as if there are implementation that we've done, we want to make sure that is uh, announced to all the staff. So really, it's, it's an ongoing process. Uh, you know, staff training is very unique because oftentimes we may have, for example, a cab decision that comes out and give us a new process to proceed. So we'll also, you know, often work with our partners at OAG to get training on those issues as well. So we always want to make sure that we're on top of any issues that are new to the district and make sure our staff is aware of those issues. Okay. I, I might have heard or misheard that training has been lacking during the pandemic. I'm not going to ask to elaborate, but I will ask about it at a future hearing. So, Well, um, lacking is probably the, <laughs> not the proper word to use, but it's really one of those that, unlike where I could travel to California for training for a week, I can no longer do that. So those are the things we're talking about. So we are not able to take those uh, extended training that help us to get best practices and move forward in the agency. But... Um, the point I'm making is that we're, we've been very busy um, the last 18 months. 
our staff. I want to say thank you to my staff personally because I think they've been really working continuously to make sure the city stays um, on top of every issues that we're facing. So the procurement team, as you know, is the heart of the agency, and we want to make sure that we acknowledge the hard work that they've done. Okay. Give me one second. I'm, my, my, I'm asking my team if I missed something, and they're telling me I did, but I'm, I'm not clear. So pardon me one second. Okay. Um, no, it looks like we uh, are good to go. It, it, for um, DGSO, how, how often do you revisit the training requirements for uh, your procurement staff? Uh, we do it um, annually. Um, and sometimes if there's a change in, for example, as I mentioned earlier, if there's a cap case that gives us a different direction as how certain processes work, our policies, and we want to make sure we um, we emphasize, emphasize that, that new um, law or that interpretation, and make sure our staff is aware of it. Um. Okay. Uh, is there is there anything else that that, that we're missing that um, either agency thinks is important to highlight? Anything else with the councilman? Only that we'll continue to coordinate smartly, uh, Chairman, and. Uh, I think you, you have broadly a, a group of, of contracting and procurement professionals uh, and, and program managers that do an incredible job. They've done an incredible job the last 18 months over COVID and have a significant amount of requirements uh, that, that we're going to be uh, supporting our district residents then uh, going forward. So uh, we'll continue with the, the coordination, Chair. I appreciate it. Uh, well, those are all the, the questions that I have for today. Um, I do want to note that for anyone who was unable to testify but would like to submit testimony, uh, to, written testimony is welcomed and encouraged and will be made part of the official record. So anyone interested in submitting official testimony may send it by email to the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities at facilities at dccouncil.us. Uh, but the hearing for this, uh, the record for this hearing will close at the close of business on November 11th, 2021. So please submit testimony by then. With that, the business before this committee is concluded. The time is now 2.05 p.m. and this public hearing is adjourned. Now, thanks to everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Thank Chairman. You, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Have a good day. You too. Yes, sir.